Thank you, Jesus. Well, it's good to see you tonight. How many love the presence of Jesus that's in this place? Praise God. We welcome you. Anybody visiting for the first time tonight? Just slip you. Oh, bless you. So glad you're here. God bless you. Praise God. God bless you guys. Awesome. Well, we're delighted you're here. At the end of the service, we will give you an opportunity to give. And um, you that are visiting the first time don't have to give unless you want to. But there is a card in the seat back near you. And if you'd take a moment and fill that out, then we'd have a record of your visit. We'd have your name. And we take those names, your names, and we pray over them. Every Monday night, we have a prayer service here. Almost every Monday night of the year. Just a few exceptions, Memorial Day, Labor Day, things like that. Um, we, but other than that, we are here practically every Monday night for just a prayer service. And this has been happening for about nine years now. I am so thankful for a people that value the power of prayer enough to come back on a Monday night. And it's just about an hour long, hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes, and we worship the Lord. We, we have a brief exhortation from the Word, and then we just pray. We pray for needs, and about every Monday we have, I don't know, 50, 80, uh, 80 prayer requests. To the average, maybe about 80 that are sent in from, uh, sometimes it's more than that. And, um, and we pray over those individual needs, and we pray over the names of all those who visit as well. And then we have a time of, pro of prophetic declaration. And it's a powerful time of kingdom work. Somebody say amen. amen. And I want to encourage you that are part of the house. I know, you, I know most people can't make it every Monday night. I am so thankful for those who do make it every Monday night. But if you can't, I just want to encourage you to make it as many Mondays as you can. If it's one, you know, if you make a decision, I'm going to be at least one Monday night a month in the prayer service, that matters, and your presence matters. Amen. Amen. Whether or not you come up to a microphone and lead in prayer, you don't. there's no pressure to do that. You don't have to do that. Just you being here in agreement, it matters. Somebody say amen. amen. And it shows the value of prayer. Hallelujah. You know, I, and I love, I just want to give honor again to those who consistently show up maybe not every single monday night but cons there's a consistency to your showing up and others who maybe not be here tonight but i appreciate that and it shows that those folks you who consistently show up for prayer on monday night you know what it says you believe in the power of prayer amen and it doesn't have to be spectacular we don't have to put on big flashing lights and, and get in a big name somebody to come do. No, hallelujah. You just know the value of prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. So I, can we give those, can we give our prayers? I know they don't need it or want it, but I just feel like we're going to give them a God bless you. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It matters. It matters. Well, praise God. If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, and stand for the reading of the word. We'll stand for this one verse, then we'll pray over our word tonight. We've been in, in, in a series on freedom from emotional bondage, and I, I, I trust you've been blessed in this series, sort of an impromptu series. The Holy Spirit just sort of led us into it, and uh, I've been blessed. How many of you have been blessed by, by this series? We want to get free. Emotions are given to us by God. They're God-given gifts, and they are beautiful in their proper place. But when emotions are leading us, when emotions are driving us, when emotions are in charge, uh, they're horrible. Emotions make good servants and bad masters. That's the way money is, too. Money makes a great servant, but it's a horrible taskmaster, right? So Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. And I, I want to say you can't, you can't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and be driven by your feelings. I'm going to say that again. I, I'm going to say you can't follow the leading. You cannot be led by the Holy Spirit and at the same time led or driven by emotions. Now, the Holy Spirit may use and speak and deal with your emotions, but, 
but we've got to learn the difference. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, you are not restricted by us. You are not restricted. You are not confined or limited by us, but you are restricted by your own affections, your own feelings, your own loves. You are not restricted, confined, limited by us. See, they were saying, it's you. And he said, no, it's not us. It's your own feelings. It's your own uh, affections, your own loves. And so how many want to be unrestricted? <laughs> how many want to walk in the, in the freedom of the Holy Spirit? Now, that doesn't mean there are no limits. That doesn't mean that God doesn't have boundaries. How many know you got to live in boundaries, right? Uh, has anybody ever seen a beautiful painting? You know an amazing thing? It could be by a master. I mean, one of the, one of the greats. But that painting is not nearly as impressive outside a frame as it is inside a frame. You know what that tells us about life? Our lives are not nearly as impressive outside of as they are inside the God-given boundaries of living, right? So when God says a husband should be faithful to his one wife, that's a boundary. That's a limit. But that isn't a limit that, that is awful and horrible. No, that's what makes the marriage beautiful. Come on, you're with me? And so we want to be free to live within the boundaries that God has set, within the framework that the creator has given us father i thank you for your word and for your truth and i thank you lord that the truth makes us free you said we would know it and so i pray tonight for the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to flow in this place Holy Spirit, I pray that you would put me on and wear me like a coat. And I pray that you would enable me, Lord, to access into the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And Lord, I pray that you would give us an ear to hear and that everyone will choose to hear. You said, let him who has an ear hear. So Lord, let us choose to hear tonight and to receive the engrafted word with meekness for it will save our souls. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for healing and wholeness and pre preservation. I thank you, Jesus, that we'll not leave here the same in your mighty name. I take authority over any and every opposing power of the enemy. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, the strong Son of God, we command you to desist in your operations and go now in Jesus name and Lord I thank you for liberty and freedom to hear somebody somebody would you just give him some praise if you believe you'll receive come on hallelujah Jesus we praise you thank you Jesus you may be seated tonight thank you Lord in a mountainous region a farmer who had delivered in the valley his load was on his way home back up the mountain he had an empty truck bed. Now, this is not a, a, a small pickup. It's not an F-150 truck. It, it was one of those big trucks they use on a farm to load and carry hay and things like that. And so he's got rails up around it, and he's got a big truck bed that's now empty because he's delivered his load in the valley. So driving back up the mountain, he would, he would pick up those people who lived up in the regions near him who had they didn't have vehicles and they'd had to walk down and and do their business and gather stuff from the store and they're they're walking back up so this farmer he was a kind-hearted man so he'd just stop and let as many as could get in the back of his pickup truck filled up his cab let the others get in the back of his pickup truck and as he's driving he saw in the distance a figure of a woman walking with what was obviously a heavy, heavy load on her back. So the lady's walking this heavy load, all kinds of stuff, and it's tied to her, and she's, she's got it 
situated just right and she's going slow and climbing up that hill. He drew along beside her. He slowed down and, and stopped and she stopped and looked up and he, he, he said, would you like to ride the rest of the way up the mountain with the others in the back? And she shifted her load, wiped the sweat from her brow and she said, oh yes, thank you. Thank you. So they helped her get up in the back of the truck. They're driving, still a good long distance. And they're driving, and as they're, he's driving, trying to avoid as many of the potholes as he can, but he's climbing, winding up that mountain road. The people who were in the back with the lady, after about 30 minutes, they, they, they had, a couple of them had whispered to each other, and then finally, as, as it was going, he was going slow enough where she could hear easily, one of them said, excuse me, ma'am. She said, yes. They said, why, why don't you lay down those bags? And she looked at him as if it had not crossed her mind. See, she was in the truck, and she was happy for the truck carrying her, but she still had all those bags. She still kept that load on her back, and she's just standing up there at the front of the cab with that heavy load on her. When they asked her, why don't you lay down that load, she smiled embarrassedly because she really hadn't thought too much about it, and somebody stepped up there, and they helped her unpack. And She laid down those loads, and, and when she did, she just, she just stretched and whew, let out another sigh and enjoyed the ride the rest of the way. Hmm. You see, she had climbed into the truck, was greatly relieved not to be walking, but it hadn't occurred to her that the same power of the truck that was carrying her could take care of her bags, could take care of the baggage that she had in her life. You say, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, there are a lot of Christians that are on the highway of holiness. We're on the highway to heaven, and we know the only way we're going to make it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We know the only way we're going to make it is by the grace of God. We know that if we're going to get to heaven, it's got to be by grace and, and by grace alone. How many, how many know that? And, and, and so we're, we're riding in the, can I say it this way? We're riding in the grace truck. We, we got in the truck. We're riding in the grace truck. And we're so happy that we not have to work our way up this great hill to get home, to get to heaven. And yet there are many of us like this little woman. Though we're in the truck, we still are loaded down with all kinds of bags, with all kinds of anxieties, with all kinds of worries and all kinds of regrets and all kinds of fears and all kinds of, of uh, uh, impulsivities and all kinds of issues. We're still carrying so much stuff from yesterday and, and carrying things. And, and, and so we're happy to be on the truck, but we're still worn out. We're still quite weary because we're standing with this heavy load on us. Well, how many believe, like that little woman, we ought to, we ought to embarrassingly smile and, and say, yeah, help me. Help me get this stuff off me. Help me, help me get these bags off me. Come on, help me lift up your hand and say, if I'm going to ride the grace truck, I don't want to ride it with a heavy load on my back. I might as well. I felt the witness of the Holy Spirit. Somebody ought to wave with me and say, I might as well lay it all down. I might as well lay my, my troubles down Lay my fears down, lay my worries down, lay it all down, and let the same power that's carrying me to heaven carry these loads. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, those two verses. Verse 7 is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Verse 6 says that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. That in due season, he'll exalt us. Humble yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, humble yourself. 
Mm-hmm. Come on, look at him again. This is good preaching. Take that, take that pointy finger you've got. Uh, you've been wanting to do this all week long. Take that pointy finger and point it right at somebody and say, humble yourself. Humble yourself. If you want to soften it, say, humble yourself, buddy. If you want to say, humble yourself, sweetheart, whatever you want to do. But if you want to soften it, add a little something on the end, a little sugar on the end. But just go ahead one more time. Look at him and say, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Come on. I could stop right here and, and just, just dig in because how many know this is our number one issue? Pride. Pride is our number one issue. This, this pride of life. So Peter says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. Verse 7, he tells us how to humble ourselves. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. You see, I've noticed something about people, especially people who are bound by the spirit of poverty, by, by a mindset of poverty, by a mindset of false humility. I've noticed something about people that, that are, are, they've limited themselves. They're not restrained by, by anyone but themselves. And they've limited themselves in their own thinking. And they have this mindset of, of poverty, this mindset of of smallness and false humility. See, they are the kind of people that get in the truck. They get in the truck and they're appreciative of the ride up the hill, but they, they don't take the burdens off, the bags off. And they tell themselves that, that, that they don't want to impose, that he didn't exactly say, get up in the truck and lay your bags down. He just offered me to get up in the truck. And so they tell themselves they don't want to impose. They tell themselves they don't want to take advantage. They tell themselves, you know, they even tell themselves that they are tough enough. Well, I'm, I'm tough enough. These other people may need to lay their bags down in the truck, but I'm tough enough to carry my own load up this. You know, I'll, I'll, take, the, I'll take the truck ride, but I'm tough enough to carry my, my load on up the hill uh oh come on how many know what I'm talking about people who 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 accept something but they they don't want to accept all for whatever the fear is whatever the lie is that that they believed in their thinking but how many lift up your hand and say I want to walk in freedom come on are you ready to walk in freedom in Jesus name look with me at Luke chapter 6 the sixth chapter of the gospel of Luke Here's one of my favorite stories here. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. And it says, Now it happened on another Sabbath also that Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Now withered means that it was paralyzed and withered means it's drawn in. And so his right hand would have, would have perhaps looked something like this. It had not fully developed. It had, or if, it, we don't know if it was from birth or an accident, if it had been developed to a degree. After an accident, it had atrophied the muscles, and, and now it is drawn in. And so he, he can't do this. He has no use of his right hand. Luke is a medical doctor, remember? And so when he writes the story, he's the only one. Matthew tells this story, Mark tells this story, and Luke. And Luke is the only one that tells us it was his right hand. Why? Because he asked. He's the doctor. He wants to know, is it your right one or your left one? Right? How many know when you go to the doctor, they don't tell you what's wrong with you, you tell them what's wrong with you. And then they practice. Ah, come on, hallelujah. They still call it a medical practice, right? And they call it that for a reason because they're not God in spite of what a few of them think. They are, they are not God. They have not. I'm losing some amens. I'm a, this is, you're acting like I'm speaking at a convention of doctors. <laughs> hallelujah. Well, well, Luke, the physician, he, he makes note it's his right. And so it's withered. It's paralyzed. He has no use of it. And it's drawn in. And so there was a man there, his right hand was withered. The scribes and Pharisees watched Jesus closely 
whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. They watch Jesus to see if he's going to heal the guy, not because they want to rejoice, but they want to accuse him of working on Sabbath. But he knew, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man who had a withered hand, Arise, come here, stand, stand here. Arise, get up, come, come stand here. And he pulls the man out of the crowd and pulls him to stand in front of everyone. Come, come stand here. And the man arose and stood. Then Jesus said to the, to the people, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, Mark records with anger. When he had looked around at them all angrily, Jesus is mad. I know, I know we, don't, we don't recognize the angry Jesus in the 21st century. Uh-oh, getting quiet in here. But you need to read the Bible. There, there were moments when Jesus got quite angry, and this is one of them. Why was he angry? Because of the hardness of their heart because they don't care at all about the suffering of this individual. All they're interested in is one, is their interpretation of the law and whether or not it's going to be broken. And so, so Jesus looks around at them angrily and, uh, and as he, after he asked the question, then he says to the man, stretch out your hand. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, stretch out your hand. Come on, tell, tell him again, stretch, stretch out your hand. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he did. Now, now let me ask you a question. When he says to the man, stretch out his hand, it, it's obvious, right, that he's talking about the, the maimed one, the lame one, the paralyzed one, the withered one. It's obvious he's talking about the right hand. But I wonder if the man was tempted to stretch out his left because his left arm, if his right arm is maimed, how many know that the human body is amazing at compensating? So if his right hand is withered and paralyzed and unusable, how many know that his left arm must have been an amazing specimen of manhood? Because he's used it perhaps all his life. He's used this left arm. So it would have been, a, a, I mean, a good-looking arm, a strong arm, a, a good example of what a man looks like, sort of like mine. You always laugh like that. And I, I, it just does something to my ego. I, I'm... So we know, we know that Jesus is referring to the, the right one. I'm sure the man knew it as well, but I, I just have to wonder if he was tempted to stretch out the left one. But if he was tempted, he made a quick decision and he said, I don't need any help over on this side. I got this side's working good. I need some help on this side. And this Jesus isn't just another teacher. He's not just another philosopher. He's not just another rabbi. He's got the ability to do something with what nobody else can. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, hear me. Jesus is not just another religious figure. He's not just another teacher. He's not just a good prophet, a good teacher as some religions acknowledge. I dare you lift up your hand and say he's the son of the most high God. He has the power, hallelujah, to restore and to make whole that which is broken. So the man stretches out what he couldn't stretch out. Oh, wouldn't you love to have been there as he Looks down and every eye in the place is looking and then he, he begins to, to do it. His fingers begin to move. Can you imagine the big old smile that came on his face and on the faces of his friends and the big old frown that came on the faces of the religious leaders? And hallelujah, I dare you to look at your neighbor and say, and if I'd have been there, I'd have smiled as much at the frown on the Pharisee's face. Hallelujah, as the smile of joy on this man's face because his hand was restored, verse 10, as whole as the other. 
Hallelujah. How many know God does a quick work? And what it, listen, what had taken years to develop the left side, God said, I'm just going to touch the right side. Hallelujah. Because I don't want you spending the rest of your life like this. Glory to God. And, and, but the Bible says, look at this verse. But they, verse 11, were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Who's they? Well, that's not the common folks. That's these religious leaders. That, that's these the scripture refers to as the Jews. They, 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 they don't want to see the power of God released because they don't have it. And so, so they're against it. And, and, but thank God for this man. He stretched out what was wrong with him. And Jesus made it right. He stretched what was wrong with him. In other words, he he stretched, in our context tonight, he stretched to lay down some things. He stretched to let go of some things. He stretched. Now, if he had been born this way, if he had been born this way, and even if it had come as an accident, How many know that this man has a mother in his life? He may have a wife. We don't know all the details about his story. But he's probably got a woman in his life somewhere. A mother, a wife, maybe a a sister, a loving sister. We we don't know. But what I, I do know about this man, if he had a lady in his life who cared for him, especially his mom and then a wife, How many know that they would have helped him? They would have helped him be able to dress in such a way to minimize attention to what is wrong with him and to highlight what is right, what is good about him. They would have have trained him. They would have fixed special garments they uh, they I, I think he probably had a tailored clothes that he wore that the way the the garment fell caused there to be a minimizing of attention to the withered part of his life and a drawing of attention to that part of his life which was strong and flourishing come on are you with me right now you say why is that important well that's important because You see, some people never get free from emotional bondage and never lay down emotional baggage because they have become experts at minimizing weakness. Religious people lead the bunch. By religious people, I don't just mean everybody you disagree with. Because have you noticed we live in a culture in the church that anybody that doesn't agree fully with your viewpoint on an issue has a religious spirit. We need to grow up and just let people disagree. Uh Uh-oh. I said we need to grow up and just let people disagree. So when I say religion, I'm not just referring to that kind of thing that's become so popular and thrown around so easily in our culture, in our church society, I'm talking about the fact that, that in church, we somehow got the idea that we've got to always show only our good sides. We've got to always show the smile, that we can't let down our guard and show anybody that we're struggling. Now, look, I don't believe we ought to walk around. I, uh, you know, let me say it this. Let me back up and say it this way. We've got the idea that we've got to live a veiled, covered life. But how many know sometimes you've got to learn how to be transparent with the right people at the right time? Now, I don't mean we're going to walk around in our underwear. I don't mean that kind of transparency. Come on, I want you to hear me. I'm not trying to be funny. I want you to hear me because some people think that transparency means that I'm just walking around in my underwear and just telling, telling you every bit of issues I've got, every struggle I've got, every little thought I, I, I have come in my mind. No, no, not talking about that. But, but you see, we've gone, we, we love to swing to the pendulum to one extreme or to the other extreme. And Jesus said it's a narrow way that leads to life. And the narrow way isn't at this end of the, the, of the truth or that end of the truth the narrow way is straight down the middle of the truth it's not either or 
It's both and. Come on, are you hearing me? So, so I need to learn to be transparent. And we need to find people in our life that, we're, that we're, we can do life with that we don't always have to put on that, that religious face. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? You be struggling, you know, husband and wife be going at it with each other. Rah, 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 rah. Get to church, close the door, turn around. Somebody's walking up beside the car. Oh, hey, brother, how you doing? And that brother says, well, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed with the best and not stressed. Man, they would have thought you were not stressed about three minutes earlier down the road. Come on. So we've learned how to minimize our weaknesses, to cover them up, not to draw attention to them. The problem, the, the real issue with this is that eventually, if you do this enough, eventually you can't even see it. Eventually you get so accustomed to it that you no longer see it as an issue, as a problem, as a weakness. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? That, don't, that means that somebody feels better about themselves. The problem with that is that person will never get healed because you're never going to receive something you don't think you need. Oh, come on. So you got to be willing. Somebody lift up your hand and say, i got to be willing to stretch out the weak side. Come on, hallelujah, I feel, I feel the Holy Ghost. I gotta be willing to stretch out the weak side. Listen to me, God spoke to me these words. I want, you to hear, I want you to hear them. There is a part of your destiny in God that you cannot grasp with strength. You can only grasp it with weakness. Mm. I'm gonna say it again. There's a part of what God has for you and I that we cannot grasp in our strength. We can only grasp it in our weakness. I think I need to say it one more time. I don't mean weakness as in perpetually sinning. I'm talking about coming to a place where we humble ourselves and acknowledge I'm not good at that. I'm struggling with this. I need help. And when I stretch out to God what it is, come on, God's asking some men and women and boys and girls tonight, he's saying, stretch it out. He said, I'm putting the spotlight on you and I'm gonna make you uncomfortable and I'm asking you, inviting you, stretch your issue out. Stretch that baggage out to me. Stretch it out and lay it down. And you and I have gotta make a decision. Are we gonna gonna stretch out our weakness or are we gonna stretch out our strength? Come on, there are times even in our prayer life where we avoid getting real with God. We spend all our time, we, we, have, we have a list we pray through and we're praying for this one and 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 we're praying and we pray, how many, how many have ever heard somebody that just prayed rapid fire? And then when they finish their prayer, in Jesus' name, Amen. And the Lord said, wait a minute, I had something to say to you. Well, catch me tomorrow, Jesus. I got to get on to my next project. Or, or, okay, Lord, I know, I know you need to say something to me about that brother. Because he really is going off. He's just going off. That sister Maybe, maybe about my husband. You need to say something to me about my husband. Lord, yeah, what do, what do you want to say about I've said a lot to you about him. What do you want to say to me about him? And the Lord says, no, I really don't want to talk to you about your husband. I'd like to talk to you about you. Well, 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 well okay, okay, yeah, I'm hurting. I, I, yeah, it hurts. It really does hurt, so thank you. The Lord said, no, I want to talk to you about you hurting him. I want to, uh, oh, Lord, I, I know you want to talk to me about my wife. He said, yeah, yeah, I would like to talk to you. Okay, yeah, Lord, I know, I know. She's just, oh. And the Lord says, well, I'd like to talk to you about the way you've been mistreating her. Because she's my daughter, and you haven't been treating my daughter very nice. Well, well, we don't want to hear that. See, we don't want to deal with our 
issues with the bags that we keep carrying around, with the weakness that we have. And God says, I'm inviting you. There's part of destiny. There's part of your future. You'll never grasp it with strength. You can only grasp it in weakness. It's what Paul said in Corinthians where he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, in your weakness, my strength is perfected. Hallelujah. Come on, we all, we all want to be strong, right? We all want to just beat our chest. We all want to be superhero Christians. We all want to be this. Or, how many know the church is filled with a lot of wonderful crusaders? They always want to go to this thing and that thing and that issue and that issue. And if there's a crusade, if there's a campaign, whoa, they're in. That's wonderful if we're allowing moments where, where we just sit with the Lord. And we let him not talk to us about that political party and that political leader and that preacher and that issue and the, uh, my spouse and my this. But we let the Lord talk to us about us. Mm. You know what I found out? God wants to do a whole lot more talking to me about Keith than about any other human. Oh, come on. When I want him to deal with somebody else in my world, he says, I'll deal with them, but let you and I talk about you. Well, I don't want to talk about me. He says, I know that's your issue. That's why you're still acting like a baby. That's why you, oh, come on, hallelujah. Look at someone and say, I hope he stops preaching about you and moves on, moves on, moves on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, here's the other thing, though. See, some people don't want to show their bags. They don't want to lay down their bags because they're afraid somebody's going to be able to look in them and see. They don't even want God looking in them because some of the bags you haven't opened in so long, you don't even know what's in there except you know it's dirty and it stinks. But, but you're still carrying it around, carrying it around out of fear that somebody else will find out about it. But then there are other people that they don't stretch their weakness forward because they found their identity in the weakness. They, they don't want to let down those bags. They don't want to leave, put those bags down, not so much because they're afraid somebody will look in them, but they're afraid somebody will look in them and won't know it's theirs. This is my pain. This is my story. This is who I am. I've, I've, I've been this way since I was 15. I got a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. I'm not, I'm not, try, I'm not making fun. I'm, I'm trying to communicate that sometimes we find our identity in the wrong place. We find our identity in our pain. And so the problem becomes if we get healed of our pain, who will we be? Who am I without this struggle with addiction? Who am I without this issue from my childhood? Who am I? And so we don't, fully, we don't fully embrace the idea that we can move on, not because we don't think God is able sometimes and not because we're too embarrassed to, to show our weakness. Sometimes it's because we're afraid. What does the future look like without me having to deal with these issues? We got we to gotta let the Lord, we got to make a decision. Somebody lift up your hand and say, I got to make a decision that I'm going to lay down some bags or I'm going to keep carrying them, right? I, I prayed with thousands of people in my lifetime in prayer lines. You know what I discovered? Some people who come forward for prayer, they don't want to be healed. They just want another opportunity to tell their pain. They just want somebody else to look at them with pity. And once they get that look of pity out of you, they got their fix. They don't want to get healed of the thing because they're used to that fix, that pity fix. Come on, are you hearing me? I, I was, I, some of you heard me tell this story before, but I was down in Alabama and I'd, I'd preached at, uh, I'd preached down in um, 
Good Springs. And uh, we were, the pastor there, dear friend Ben, uh, he, he took me and the family on Sunday afternoon. They took us up to Jasper, Alabama, and we ate at the Golden Corral. So we're eating at Golden Corral, and all of a sudden, I heard somebody in the restaurant yell my name. It's packed out. Somebody yells real loud, Brother Keith! Brother Keith! I, I look around, and, and here comes this guy, and he's from, uh, he's from Kayla's home church, Car- Carbon Hill, Alabama, Elm Grove. And so he's from 30 minutes the other direction, the, the west, and we were, I was 30 minutes south. And so he yells, he comes over, hey, Brother Keith, good to see you. We shake hands or whatever and, and, and exchange pleasantries. And then he said, as he's getting ready to go get his food, he said, Brother Keith, will you give your dad a message for me? I said, well, sure, certainly. What, what's the message? He said, will you tell your dad it's his fault? Well, that struck me strange. I said, okay, but what's his fault? He said, because of your dad, I had to go back to work. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been on a disability check for 15, 20 years with my back. So I've been drawing disability. But last time your dad was at our church, he prayed for me and I got healed. He said, God healed my back and I had to go back to work. Now, thank God he was willing to receive it. Hallelujah. I'm not going to, yeah, come on. How many, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many know some people that if they got healed, they, they'd say, Lord, give me that, give me that trouble back because I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to go to work. I've been enjoying just hanging out at home and, and still drawing a check. So you got to ask yourself, why are you carrying the baggage? Are you carrying it because? You haven't really thought about the the fact that if you're riding in the truck, the same power that's carrying you will carry your bags. Or is it because you, you just don't want anybody to see that you got any ugly baggage? You don't want anybody to be aware. You've ignored it long enough. You've minimized it long enough that you don't even think it's an issue. The Holy Spirit starts pushing at it and you make a decision to draw back and to turn your good side to the Lord, your good side to the people, your good side. Even when you go in the mirror, uh, in the restroom, you, you, you turn your good side because you don't want to take a really good look at yourself and is it that or, or is it because you, you, you've so become your pain? You've so become your problem that you don't turn your weakness away. You, you parade your weakness because it is this weakness it is get, that gets people to pity you and to, to look at you and, to, and to, to maybe give you stuff and to pat you on the back and say, oh, poor little you you got to make a decision. Are you willing to lay down the baggage? How many lift your hand and say, I want to I wanna lay down some baggage? Hallelujah. I'm not going to preach these. I just want to, I, I just have a little acronym. I want you to listen to this as I close. Baggage, baggage. B stands for bondage. Bondage. The Lord Jesus wants you to be free. And, and there are some bondages that are spiritual in nature, but there are other bondages that are simply soulish. They're emotional. And sometimes it's intertwined where because of the emotional issue, it's given an access point for a demon to come in and to torment in that area. But can I tell you, that no matter what the bondage is, you and I can be free in the name of Jesus. Come on, hallelujah. I dare you to lift up your hand and say, Jesus died so I could be free. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody wave and say, not just when I get to heaven one day, he died so we could be free right here, right now. Right here, right now. The B stands for bondage, but somebody praise him that you can be free. 
Now, here's some areas of bondage I'm going to list in the rest of this acronym. A stands for attitudes. Your altitude is determined by your attitude. If you grumble and gripe and complain, you're always going to be miserable. But if you learn to be grateful and thankful for what you have and where you're at, you're going to find yourself beginning to rise. Come on, you're hearing me? How many have ever met somebody with a bad attitude? Come on, if you've ever looked in the mirror, you should have lifted your hand right there. Because you have met somebody at some point with a bad attitude, right? I mean, look, look at your neighbor and help me preach and say, we just need an attitude adjustment every now and then. Hallelujah. We, <laughs> glory. And the Holy Spirit is a genius at giving us attitude adjustments. Amen. The G, the next, the, the first G stands for guilt. See, somebody's, some people's bag is, is, is a baggage, a bondage of attitudes. They just got a bad attitude. It stinks, stinking thinking stinking attitudes and it keeps them limited and keeps them constrained and keeps them from the best God has others it's guilt there are Christians that are still carrying guilt from sin they repented of 40 years ago and and you keep maybe maybe it's four years whatever but you keep repenting for sin that God doesn't even remember The Bible says when he forgives you, he cast it away from you. As far as the east is from the west into the sea. And and the Bible doesn't call it the sea of forgetfulness, but that's a good term that somebody put on it. He throws it into a sea never to remember it again. And yet we're carrying such heavy loads of guilt. And with guilt, regret, saying, oh, I I did this, and I shouldn't have done this, and I didn't do this, and I should have done this. But somebody, would you lift your hand, stretch it out like this, say, I'm going to drop that bag. I'm going to drop that bag in the name of Jesus. Come on. There is therefore, Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Then would you lift up your hand and say, there's no condemnation. Come on. There's conviction but there's no condemnation. Now, what is the difference between condemnation and conviction? Conviction always has hope attached to it. Condemnation never has hope attached to it. Condemnation will make you feel like there is no hope. But if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of an attitude or a sin, it comes with hope. All I need you to do is repent of it. And you're free in Jesus' name. The next G stands for grief. Some people are carrying a bag of grief. Grief, grief. Grief over a failed marriage. Grief over the way they were treated by their parents. Grief over a loved one that has passed. Grief, grief. That can become a heavy bag. The Bible says we do not sorrow as the world, as those without hope. You don't have to carry a bag of grief. You can be free in Jesus' name. You just got to stretch it out and let him touch it. Lay it down. Somebody say amen. The next one is anger. Let me know that's a heavy bag. The wrath of men does not work the righteousness of God. There are people, though, that are just always on the verge of anger. I speak over you in the name of Jesus. You're going to stretch that out because there's a root cause. The anger is never the root. There is a root that causes the anger. And in the name of Jesus, I declare you're going to be made whole. But to be made whole, you got to stretch that out. Quit defending your anger. Quit, quit making excuses for your angry outbursts. Quit making excuses for your angry tirades. And come before God and stretch out your weakness. And say, God, I don't know what the cause of this is, but I need you to heal me. Come on. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And then the next G is glitz. Glitz. What do you mean by glitz? I mean like a rhinestone Christian. Oh, 
A lot of compromising on the way to my horizon. But I'm going to be where the lights are shining on me. Like a, uh, some of you don't know the song, but, but you, you, come on, huh? yeah, yeah. Come on, let me, let me go through those lyrics again. There will be a load of compromising. On the road to my horizon. But I'm going to be where the lights are shining on me. I mean, no, that attitude has swept the American church. Everybody wants to be where the lights are shining on me. Glitz becomes a heavy bag. This, this desire for fame becomes a heavy bag. We've got to lay it down. All right. And then the E is expectations, specifically unrealistic expectations. Do you know, men, is this all right tonight? Am I doing all right? Going a little longer than I intended, but is this, are, you, are you getting something? Many... I realized this this morning. Most of the offenses that people carry in life have to do with unrealistic expectations. Most, most of the people that are offended at you are offended at you and you don't know why. Well, how is it that so many people get offended at us and we really don't know why? Well, could be that we're living such self-focused life we were unaware on the level we should have been aware. Could be that. But it could also be that they put on us, on you and on me, we put on others unexpressed, unrealistic expectation. We expected that person to say such and such, and they did it. We expected them to do this or that, and they did it. And we got offended by it. And if we really wake up, we realize that that was an unrealistic expectation. For instance, in a marriage, how many know your spouse can't fix and solve and meet all your needs? Uh-oh, getting quiet. There's only one who can do that, and his name is Jesus. Come on. But if we go into a marriage expecting our spouse to meet all of our needs there's going to be some disappointment and if we allow that disappointment to grow it'll turn into resentment and then before long there's an offense come on am i helping somebody yeah unrealistic expectations unexpressed expectations can be a heavy heavy bag that we've been carrying for way too long. But how many will lift your hand and say, Lord, I want to drop these bags. Come on, I want to drop these bags. Will you stand with me tonight and just say, Jesus, I, I, I want to drop these bags. I want to, hallelujah. In fact, I want to ask you to do this. Baggage, baggage, bondage, attitudes, guilt, grief, anger, Glitz, expectations. How many say, Lord, I've been carrying all of those and, and others. But tonight, in the name of Jesus, by faith, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch out. I'm going to stretch out my weakness. I believe, I believe the power of God is going to touch my life, my living. Because as I surrender to Christ, he comes to help me. He comes to heal. He comes to deliver. He comes to free. So I challenge somebody here tonight to just stretch out your right hand. Just stretch out your right hand and, and say, Lord, I just give you my weakness. I give you my weakness. Or maybe for you, it's your left hand that's the weak side. Whatever your weak side is, just stretch it out. Stretch it out. And just begin to rehearse. Let the Holy Spirit help you. Think of things that where, where you've been 
been, you've been holding on. You've been either trying to hide your weakness even from yourself or you've found your identity in your weakness, in your issues, in your, in your struggles, in your anger, whatever, and just say, I'm going to trust Jesus tonight. I'm going to trust Jesus. Come on, will you just stretch out to Jesus? Hallelujah, there's an anointing in here. Father, I have preached and I've taught your word and I thank you that, Lord, the Holy Spirit confirms the word with signs following. And I believe that right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, deliverance is going to manifest in lives as we stretch out to you. We stretch our weakness to you. We humble ourselves under your hand. We cast our, our cares. We bring our anxieties, our fears, our worries, our, our struggles. We bring them and we just lay them down in the bed of the truck. We lay them down in the bed of this grace truck, Lord. We've trusted your grace to carry us to heaven, Lord, but we've been struggling up this, up this mountain. Even on the back of the truck, we're worn out. We're weary because we're carrying these heavy things. But in the name of Jesus, we lay it down. We lay it down. Come on, you just need to say that. You, you just need to say, I lay it down. Maybe you need to leave your seat and come and, and lay it at the altar. This altar's open. Do that. Just say, I, I'm laying it down. I'm laying it down, Lord. Oh, if your burden is heavy, I lay it down, Jesus. There is freedom. Oh, lay it down, lay it down, Jesus. Help us tonight. Help us tonight, Father. Help us, we pray. We lay it down in this place. Freedom, Father, all over the room, from the front to the back. Thank you for hearts that are reaching out to you. Lord, we thank you for freedom tonight. We just lay it down. In the name of Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus. There are showers of mercy Come on. and grace. There is freedom. Oh, you believe that freedom reigns in this place. Give it all, give it all to Jesus. Showers of mercy and grace, they are falling on every face. There is freedom. Oh, Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus reigns in this place. There are and grace falling on every face there, there is freedom Father we thank you in this series I've been preaching with a little teaching and as the Lord leads in the days to come we want to visit some of these things and go a little deeper in the teaching all of those things we just talked about in just the acronym of baggage we're just barely touching something you say well what's the point in that well if if touching guilt or glitz you felt a little something then that's an indication by the holy spirit that you've got a wound in that area and you need to go just a little deeper you need to say Lord I, I don't want to live with this wound because how many know that hurting people hurt people so we need to be healed people because healed people bring healing to people and your family needs you whole W-H-O-L-E your family needs you healed your friends need you healed and so, in this series, I want you to know that I know that we're just scratching the surface. We're, we're, not, we're not going deep into it yet. But how many sense the Holy Spirit doing something? Because, listen, here's what I've discovered. Some people get healing and freedom in a big room with, in a moment of worship at your seat. Other people get healing and freedom, kneeling. 
And sometimes for, for me, I've gotten healing there, and then I've gotten healing here. And then sometimes I got healing in a, in a, in a smaller setting with just some friends in a room. And, but sometimes I got the healing just by myself with the Lord. And by healing, I mean deliverance. Deliverance from spiritual things that had tried to attach themselves and emotional things. You can get healed. Don't limit where and how God can do the healing and the freeing. And in these moments, when God begins to touch something, that's when you just open up. And you say, yes, Lord. And you leave here tonight, not only with a touch of healing, but you leave here with an awareness of an area where you need to take it to the Lord in prayer. But listen, if you don't get that breakthrough by yourself in prayer with the Lord, then that's an indication you need the help of another brother or sister in Christ. Don't let pride keep you. Number, the first thing is you need to open up about that and stretch toward Jesus in your own prayer time. But then there comes some things in our lives where we need to stretch it out in the presence of others. Maybe one-on-one -on -one with a trusted friend or a small group of men or women, whatever the case may be. Or maybe in an atmosphere like this, we, we need whatever the level is. How many will just say, I'm, Lord, I just want to walk in freedom. I just want to walk in freedom. Come on. And whatever, whatever it takes, Jesus already did the hard thing. I, whatever it takes for me to receive it and to walk in it. Come on, can somebody just wave and say, that's what I'm about. That's what, oh, hallelujah. I, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. So will you take just a moment and just reach over to somebody again? I know we prayed for one another, but I want you to pray in this atmosphere in light of what I have just taught. And I want you to pray freedom for them in the name of Jesus. I want you to pray freedom for them. And maybe you need to go to someone specific, specific. Maybe there's somebody that you just need to humble yourself and say, go to them. Maybe cross the room and say, I just need you to pray with me right now. Will you do, do that? Come on, can we take just 60 seconds or so and just do that right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Strongholds are being broken. I thank you. Healing is manifesting. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that pride is being laid by our side. We humble ourselves tonight. We believe you for healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that it is not by might, nor is it by power, but it's by your spirit. Lord, we thank you for healing us of emotional wounds. Heal our attitudes. Heal us, Lord, and free us from guilt. And heal us from grief, we pray. Lord, whatever the root is of anger in so many lives, let it be touched by your, your nail-scarred hand. And let there be freedom in the name of Jesus. Lord, where, where there's been rejection, where there's been the fear of rejection that has become a stronghold, let freedom come in Jesus' mighty name. And healing, we pray. Oh, Father, we pray, God, that where there is glitter, where there is this deep desire for the lights, where there's a deep desire for the applause of men and the affirmation of others, Lord. God, I pray that there would be healing, that we will not need the affirmation of others to be who you've called us to be and secure about it. But we'll just, we live for you and we hear your voice saying that you have called us your son. You've called us your daughter. Father, I thank you. I thank you that our expectations are going to come in alignment with truth with truth and that the unrealistic lying expectations that so many have lived with Lord are going to be defeated and the truth is going to prevail and we're going to walk in the truth in the name of Jesus and we'll walk in real faith and not presumptuous faith and not presumption I thank you for it I give you praise for it hallelujah thank you we declare freedom in this place freedom for your people in the name of Jesus Satan the Lord rebuke you loose God's people and go in the mighty name of Jesus thank you Lord thank go ahead just praise him come on praise him praise him hallelujah Jesus we bless you tonight we glorify we your name we magnify you Lord 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, glory to God. Glory to God. Anybody sense freedom in a greater measure in your life? If you do, testify to it. Come on, give the Lord some praise with me. Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. I know we're stre I'm stretching you. Stretching you, making you think about some things in a different light, but that's that's what I'm here for. Hallelujah. Praise God. Caleb's going to come and close us out. Before Caleb comes, though, let me say that we have a birthday boy in the house. Hallelujah. Brother Mike Natsul is celebrating a birthday today. Yeah. 71. Woo. Amen. 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 So happy birthday. Praise God. Can we, can we, now he, he's, he's an elder in this house, so we're going to take just a moment. We can't always do this for everybody every time, but we're going to do it tonight. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Papa Mike. Happy birthday to you. Amen. And many more. Amen, amen. Hallelujah, Caleb's coming. Have you received tonight? Praise God, I love you. I can't wait to see what God's going to do this weekend. Turn around and tell somebody, I'm about to get so blessed that you want to stay close to me because it's going to overflow in Jesus' name. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, I'm thankful for freedom. How about you? Yeah. Nights like this where you get to come and, and hear the word and the word can just wash over you and, and, and take another layer off, amen, and, and we're laying down some bags in, in this atmosphere tonight. I just want to remind you before we get ready to uh, worship God with our giving as we leave tonight, we have a few announcements I just want to, to remind you and make, make note of. Of course, the ladies, you have your heart to hearth on Saturday, May 27th at uh, 9 a.m. Make sure you sign up and uh, get registered for that. Also, the Memorial Day picnic on uh, uh, Monday, May 29th from 5 to 7 p.m. There, I think there's sign-up sheets both for the softball game and for uh, side dishes. If, you're, if you can help out with a side dish, uh, you can check with someone at the information booth and they can show you and point you in the right direction for that. And then men, our Forge Conference is coming up. Don't forget, get registered. Yeah, come on. June, or June 9th and June 10th, that's a Friday and Saturday. We've got guys coming from out of state, from other locations that are registering, so it's filling up quick. We wanna make sure that guys locally can get on the, on the, on the sign-up sheet and get registered. Uh, and you can uh, go, go on the website. You can even uh, make sure to download the new app. Uh, and you can see the events page, and, and there, there'll be a link that you can click uh, to get you to the registration there as well. So make sure you take note of that. And, and uh, with that being said, it's giving time at the Lift Church. Hallelujah. We'll get, get ready to give of our of tithes and offerings as we leave tonight. Uh, the ushers will, will bring the buckets forward. But I just want to read this uh, quick couple of verses over us as we give and it says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 and 20 it says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven how many want treasures in heaven hallelujah where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves do not break in and steal there's no better investment strategy than the one of the kingdom of heaven amen and there's good, good uh, foundational soil here at the Lift Church where your seed is really twice so seeds twice sown, uh, and it's making an impact and a, a worldwide difference uh, through the ministry here and the other ministries we support. So just want to encourage you as we get ready to give, go ahead and lift those offerings up to heaven. If you're giving electronically, make sure uh, to make note that we are switching over to the new app so you can get signed up there. Super easy, safe, simple, and secure. Uh, and it'll be a blessing to you. So, Father, we just bless your name tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you've uh, delivered to us, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, for a house of generosity, a house of, of, of not only hearers but doers, Father. And this, this act, this time of giving, Father, we do as an act of faith, an act of worship to you, Father, believing you, Father, to accomplish your mission here on the earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, and I just pray, Lord, that you would multiply this seed back to the sower. Father, I pray the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit on your people now and always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. As you go, make sure to give, shake hands, love each other, and we will see you Sunday.